Welcome to the Real Estate Fight Club, a podcast for agents where you'll witness a battle of opinions about topics affecting your real estate business. Now, always in your corner, here are your hosts, Jen Mertland and Monica Weekly. Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Fight Club. What's up, Jay Mert? What's up, Monica? I am pumped. I don't know if we're going to fight, but if there's an opportunity, I'm excited I, to do that with you. I will look for an opportunity to fight you. And I might fight Tom. I don't know. We'll see. We want him to come Me back. Me and Tom probably. are on the same team here, Monica. Thank Sorry. You. All right, guys. We have another incredible, incredible guest here today. I'm going to have Jen introduce him in one second. But today, the three of us are going to argue duke it out, fight it out, throat punch, kick, whatever, <laughs> about this question. And guys, I want you to listen up. This is huge. This is huge. Are you consulting or are you just selling? Are you showing up like a consultant? Are you showing up like an amateur seller? This is where the rubber meets the road as far as I'm concerned, as far as top agents who make a difference in their client's business, who have a lot of business, who have repeat clients. Like, I think this is the common thread amongst the top 10% doing 90% yeah. of our business in this industry. What do you think, Jen? Yeah, I agree. And that's what Tom's going to talk to us about today because Tom Caffarell is not only a realtor, he's also an investor. He's a yeah. broker owner in Boston, Massachusetts, has his own podcast, has a giant Facebook page, which we'll talk more about. But he believes there's more than one way to sell a house. So Tom, talk to us about that. What do well, you mean? Welcome to Real Estate Fight Club. And welcome. Right. Thank you for having me on. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it all started for me. So I started as an agent. And, you know, I started by basically every time I got a seller appointment, I would walk into their living room and I would say, hey, I'm the best realtor out there. You know, let me list yeah. your home. <laughs> and that's what most agents do. And it wasn't until I went on a seller appointment. It was a two family, you know, right outside of Boston, really nice area. I, you know, knocked on the door, ready to get this listing in a really hot area. And the seller opened the door. You know, she looked at me, asked me a bunch of questions. And I had to almost like talk about, you know, fight club. I had to like fight my way in. <laughs> And yeah, good I, for her. That's good. Well, yeah, and I had no, I had no idea why. So you know, I'm talking my way in. You know, we had an appointment. You know, you're ready to sell your house. So I walk in and I start looking around, and it was really crowding in there. I mean, there was stuff all over the house and whatever. And you know, I was, I was pretty young. I was like 25, and I never even knew what this was before. I think it was before the show hoarders came out, and. I never really knew what a hoarder was. I didn't know what it meant or anything mm -hmm. like that. And I mean, and even if I did, I was focused on getting that listing. Right. And so, you know, she let me look around a little bit, not the full house, and finally sat down at her living room table. And, you know, I told her all the great things I could do, all the eyes I could get on her house. And it was like, the more I talked about people seeing her house, again, mm -hmm. not knowing this, but the more I talked about it, I could see her getting like a little bit uncomfortable. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, she finally said to me, you know, this all sounds good, but I just want somebody to buy my house without coming in. Mm. Yeah. And again, not knowing anything, I'm like panicking because this would be a high price listing in a hot area where if I did get a hundred people to go through the house, which it would have, um, that would have benefited me the most. And I thought that that was what she wanted. Mm -hmm. So I kept pushing on the fact that like, well, we need to get a bunch of people in the house and oh, by the way, you should probably get these boxes out and do this and do that. And it, it Can wasn't- Can I stop you here for one second? Cause yeah, I don't yeah, want to yeah. gloss over the point you just made. You will two, two really great points. One, the highest price is not always the seller's motivation. motivation. It's not always the number one. And, and that's what she told you that, but they don't usually tell you that, right? Like you have to ask questions and you were at, you were just telling her like, this is what I can do because you were of the assumption and the perspective that that was her goal. And, you know, again, getting into like fighting, this is a fight I have with a lot of agents and a lot wow. of agents, when I talk about investing, they think that we're doing something immoral, something unethical. Yeah. 
and that buying somebody's house for less than what they could get on the MLS is wrong. Mm. But they don't understand, or at least they're not open-minded enough to have an appointment like this where I went out there and I only had the perspective of you have to list your house, you have to get your house ready for sale, which is the perspective that a lot of agents have. And it wasn't until she told me like, if you can't find me somebody that's willing to buy this house without coming in, we're not working together. Right. So it was at that moment that I got that quick education to say, I got to figure out how to get an investor to try to buy this house. Mm -hmm. And long story short, I ended up partnering with somebody on this deal that was an investor. I made great money on the deal, but most importantly, we got the seller what she wanted, which is that we got her house sold without a bunch of people coming through. And I got to know her a little bit better as the time went on. And she basically just said, as simple as this, I grew up in this house. I didn't want my neighbors to know what the inside of my house looked like. And that was my number one priority. Mm, um, wow. That's awesome. Gosh, that's such a, that's such a great story to um, sort of perspective. Yeah. To, and, and to help us all think before you walk into a house, clear your mind, like mm -hmm. eliminate your agenda mm -hmm. and just find out what the problem is. She had a problem. And, and I guess, Tom, if you would have said to her, you know, what's your number one concern or what's your number one question around getting your house sold, that might've come out a lot quicker, you know? No doubt. And, and even now when I walk in, so now that I've done, you know, close to 1500 transactions like that, I know, I now know when I walk into a property, whether it's the condition or hoarding or there's a death in the family or they've got something that says red light going off, like money isn't the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. I'm more aware of that now. Whereas in, back in that you know time of, of my life, I had no idea. I just had no clue. And so and I wasn't consulting at that point. I was selling my one product that I had and right. it was a one size fits all mm -hmm. thing. And no matter what they said to me, I was still trying to sell that product. Yeah. What are some of the questions that as agents are hearing this and they're realizing they probably lost some deals because they were so narrowly focused on the one thing that the one way they can sell a house. What are some of the questions that we can ask these sellers to figure out what their primary concern is or, and tell us other ways we can sell a house too. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, now when I go into a property and, and I go into any selling situation, I'm mainly asking questions. I mean, 80% mm -hmm. of what I'm doing is asking questions, listening to the answers. And then maybe once I diagnose the problem, I, I then give what I believe is the best solution. And the best way to think about it is like when you go into a doctor for any problem, mm -hmm. right? We want that doctor within 10 seconds they just give us a diagnosis, but they don't, they never do. And in a lot of cases, they ask questions that we feel are not relevant at all. Yes. Right. So, so, right? Yeah. But they're trained. They know that the, to, to actually diagnose you properly, I got to ask a hundred questions and maybe 80 of those questions aren't relevant, but maybe one of those questions that you thought was irrelevant is actually a key thing to ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when it comes to somebody selling their house, I like to ask them, you know, a few different things. For, number one, I want to ask them like where they're going next and what their time frame is. Right. Um, time frame is a big thing, um, especially when comparing like selling to an investor versus selling traditionally. Mm -hmm. And and recently, with the market being a little bit slower than it was a year ago today, you could basically go into someone's living room and say, "Hey, I can get you your house sold in forty five days." Now that time frame may be a little bit different. So I want to know their time frame. And I also want to know how important that time frame is to them. It's mm -hmm. one thing to want to sell your house in 45 days, but if it sells in 90 days, it's okay. It's another thing for you to tell me, hey, I want my house to be sold in 45 days. And if I go to 50 days, my house is getting auctioned. Mm -hmm. So we need to definitely know the time frame. Um, the second thing that I want to know is like whether or not they want to sell traditionally with meaning like, do they want people through their, their property right. and are they willing to do some stuff to the house that's going to get them top dollar? And in some cases, and the what's the budget for that too? Like mm -hmm. what, you know, 
For sure, and it and it and it and it depends on what's going on in the house. Like if they have knob right. and tube wiring that needs to be updated per code, okay, well that needs to be done to sell to a traditional buyer. But then there are are just like you know the simple things like cleaning the property or maybe painting a room or you know. Mm-hmm. So it depends on the condition of the house also. But I want to ultimately know, and there's so many different ways I can ask what one question which is basically like, what's the most important thing to you when it comes to selling the property? And it usually comes down to either they want to net the most amount of money for their house, Mm -hmm. or they have another thing, whether it's a time thing, or, you know, they don't want a lot of people through their house or whatever, that leads me to believe that they may want just an easier sale versus, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm Mm -hmm. willing to go through more hassle to get the most amount of money. Even the most amount of money, it's like, there's still two camps of that. So even if you want the most amount of money, it's like, do you want the most amount of money in its current condition? Or like you said, am I willing to go through some of the hassle to get? And what's your capacity to manage that, right? Like, mm-hmm. do you do you have the time to handle, right. you know, what it's going to take to get this to top top level selling? Yeah, and no Monica, doubt. You... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say no doubt. And, and I will say like, just to be clear about this, Nine out of 10 times, we find that selling the traditional way makes the most sense to, to yeah. see what they want. It's only 10% of the time that it does make sense to sell to an investor. Mm-hmm. But that 10% of the time, a lot of times that agent will have lost that deal. So what right. happens a lot of times is that they go out and, and this happens on almost all of our appointments. Let's say we do a mailer that says, hey, we want to buy your house for cash and the person receives it. Typically what they do is they call us out first as the investor. And then if they want the cash offer, they sell to us. Now their best friend might be an agent, but because they th- their agent has never said to them, their best friend has never said to them, I have multiple options. They're not even getting that appointment. Right. So, so it's kind of like a two part thing. By having both options, you're gonna serve your client better. But on top of it, you're also not going to lose transactions that you would have lost to somebody like me for no reason. Yeah. Well, and this is really the way that it's going too. like, right, like real estate as a whole, as real estate agents, we are going to have to know more with all the commission compression going on, all, you know, the Department of Justice suing NAR, it's all this stuff. Like as agents, we have to know more and having options that are best for the client situation is more important than the only the one thing you know how to do. Right. And if you add in kind of like other companies that are getting involved in this, I buying companies, I mean, Zillow, I think partnered with Open Door and you had yeah. Redfin doing this and whether or not those models end up working for those companies, I don't know, doesn't but I, I, yeah. I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they end up working. And even if people just know that Zillow has that option, to potentially get a cash offer. Now it's now it's educating the the population that that's a potential. So right. if, if, if Zillow or Redfin are promoting this and other companies that are so large like this, that's just going to make the demand to at least hear the cash offer higher. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have that ability, then that person, again, I mean, what are we all trying to prevent? We're all trying to prevent our clients from going to Zillow or Redfin before right. us. Anywhere we don't else. Want, yeah, like we don't we don't want our sphere of influence filling out forms. Like they, we don't want them you you don't want them responding to my mail or, or my TV ad. You don't want them going on Redfin or Zillow, but they're going on those things because they don't think that you have the capacity or the ability mm-hmm. to do these things. So hey, I'm gonna go on this website because I don't think you can do this type of transaction. Hundred percent because you haven't asked me the right questions to even right. understand to have the conversation that would demonstrate to me that you have some some other solution. Hundred percent, and even it's like even this conversation is a good way if if you're a prospector like you know me and Tom are not you Monica. I prospect even, just not psychotically like to people I don't know. But even if you're even just sharing with your sphere of influence or with keep cold calls. It's like, there is more than one way to sell a house that automatically piques their interest. And it's like, oh, you know, something that 99% of agents don't know, you're saying something different. 
-hmm. Well, I think on top of it, and I always say this thing, I've had, you know, experience with this in my brokerage and just, you know, seen it, you know, even outside of my brokerage, which is if you're calling somebody and you're saying, hey, you know, do you want to know the value of your home? Okay. That's just one example of kind of a more traditional realtor script. Okay. That's one, you know, product that you can talk about. The other one is, hey, you know, would you consider having me make an offer on your home? If right. you're the average seller, like which one of those two are you more interested in hearing? Do you want to the hear offer. Like, mm-hmm. the offer, right? Yeah, oh. duh, 100% of the time if you're 100%. really wanting to sell. And so I'm not necessarily, you know, saying you have to do this, but I'm just saying strategically, if you want to get into more living rooms, mm. having a cash offer is going to get you into more living rooms. It's going to get you more listings than you would have normally gotten. And that's what we found kind of as a byproduct of everything that we do. Like mm-hmm. we, we took, um, you know, I have a brokerage, but my, my team itself, like we took 300 listings last year just mm-hmm. because we're offering out the cash offer. Now I don't do that to get listings. I want to actually buy their homes, mm-hmm. but we find again that 90% of those people, yeah, I might want them to take my cash offer, but it doesn't make sense for them. So we take a lot of listings Mm-hmm. Just because we're trying to get, you know, cash deals for ourselves. I right. love that. Jen, let's take a break. And yeah. then when we come back, I'd like to hear from Tom about um, some of the, how does the average agent partner mm-hmm. up with an investor so they can have that conversation? Because the average agent can't say, would you like me to make an offer on your house without having some sort of back up to that, correct? Mm-hmm. So, right. You are reading my mind, Monica. Look at us in sync, not fighting at all. No, gosh. Boring, boring. All All right. right. We'll hear a word from our favorite partner. And when we return, Tom will give us some strategies for implementing this process. Love it. Hey, guys, Monica here. I want to talk to you about one of the favorite partnerships and tools that I have in my real estate business. And you're going to want it in your real estate business, too. It's a Choza Home Warranty the best in the business guys. They're different. They're different. And after all, isn't that what we want? Something that finally works for our homeowners. Achosa does a couple things different, but the one thing I want to highlight right here is that they let you choose your own contractors. Yes. That's what Achosa means after all, the ability or the power to choose. And so when your homeowner has something that needs fixed, they can call uh, their own vendor, their own contractor, they can have them come in and get the quote and right there on the spot, call the Achosa Home um, Warranty Customer Service and they will approve the work right then and there and your contracting can get started and the problem can be solved and we're out the door. Isn't that awesome? So Achosa Home Warranty, guys, here's what you need to know. We're using a code, Fight Club. Use code Fight Club when you sign your your buyer or seller up, and uh, that will give them twenty five dollars off their policy. Twenty five dollars off with Fight Club. If you need to call, here's their number 888-509-2916. Achosa A C H O S A Home Warranty ah, Fight Club for twenty five dollars. Go get it. All right, welcome back. Let's get back to the consultative battle inside of the ring. (laughs) Remembering that questions are the single most powerful tool in your toolkit. And I guess I talk to agents all the time. Tom, you can probably relate to this. And Jen, I know you relate to this. Agents are they're learning the business and they're like, okay, I got this listing appointment presentation. I need a listing presentation. I need to know what to say. What do I say? And it's like, don't worry about what to say. Go mm-hmm. in with a hundred questions and then solve their problem, right? It's kind of right. that simple, I think. It's but, your brain. Yeah. But Tom, help us understand how the average agent can, you know, position themselves like you're able to when you yeah, you're able to actually buy that house at this point in your career. Yeah. So well, let's just take the, you know, approach that the agent doesn't have the capacity or doesn't even want to do this transaction for whatever reason. So what a lot of agents don't understand is how valuable these transactions are to investors. They're so valuable that I have a program like within my own company 
that if you bring me a deal, just by bringing me a deal and I flip it, I'll split the profits with you 50-50. I will put up the money. I'll do the construction. We'll split it 50-50. Wow. That's how- Big finder's fee. That's nice. I'm going to move to Boston. (laughs) Just do that. So- that may sound, and, and it is generous. I'm not going to say it's it's not, but but having said that, that shows and proves how rare a really good deal is in today's market that I'm even willing to do that. Right. Um, I wouldn't have been willing to do that in 2012, 2013, right. when you no, could go right. on the, I'll go on the MLS and find a deal. I'm willing to do it now because they're so rare. Mm-hmm. So the point I'm trying to make here is like, there's there may not be a Tom Caffarella like specifically in your market, but there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be like me. Maybe they don't do a 50 50, but they're going to do something to they're going to be really, really wanting to work with you. Um, and it's not hard to find those players. There's always no. in every single market, there's at least 10 or 15 people that are similar to me that are dying for deals like this. Mm-hmm. And finding them is not hard, right? You can ask around, you can literally put into Google, you know, sell my house fast and who's bidding on Google pay-per-click. You can show up to auctions and introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. But I I promise you, if you have a deal, like it's a flip deal that you can make $50,000 on, you You will not have a difficulty finding the person willing to do that deal. Now, I wouldn't just, you know, rely on what I'm just saying. I would try to seek out a couple of investors that you kind of maybe know or feel comfortable with just so that you feel good when you're actually proposing this solution that you're going to be able to like do it. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you know, it's almost like saying, well, would you have a a hard time finding, finding a real estate agent that if you took a listing that they'd be willing to pay you a referral fee. Mm -hmm. It's almost the same type of thing where it's like, yes, some, some real estate agents, maybe they won't give you a referral fee. If you give them a listing, some Mm -hmm. won't, but Almost every investor is going to be willing to do this. And one last strategy kind of on that point is even if somebody won't split the deal with you 50-50, even if they won't give you any profit, um, you certainly can get that listing on the other yeah. side. Yeah. Right? So, I think that's a deal a lot of agents do with investors, right? I help you find the house. I get paid to do that. And then you list with me. It, and that's the minimum. That's the bare yeah, minimum. Yeah. And again- exactly. And why is that a benefit to the agent? At the bare minimum, is going to make you more money. Why? Number one, maybe that would have been a $300,000 listing sold as is, but it's going to be a $500,000 listing renovated. And then the second part to that is when you're going to an investor and you're like, I have this killer deal, you're going to make $50,000. Oh, I'm not negotiating on a, a rate you know, cut. Like I'm, I'm asking for 6%. And if and if you don't want the deal, like I'm going to the next right. person. And I, I promise you, like if there's if if you have the average regular everyday investor, they're not going to be asking you about what the commission is because they're going to want to do that that deal so badly. Mm, yeah. Got it. I think too, you're you're really helping your client, right? You're listening to what they need. You're really helping them. You're fixing their problem. To your point, Monica, and it's like wow. Now you've strengthened that relationship and you've created a new one with an investor in your market and they can teach you. I mean, Monica, you and I talk about this all the time. Like as an agent, you should also be an investor. Like what the hell are you doing? And they can teach you different things. Like how are they looking at this as a deal? How are they structuring things? Like you can learn a lot. Yeah. So tell us about the sweet spot right now and I'm, I'm i'm guessing in boston it might not be the same as around the rest of the country but maybe it is like w- with the market as it is right now what's your sweet spot for a product that you're investing in so if i'm talking about like a fix and flip and this is me personally so mm-hmm. everybody has different preferences as to what they like to do mm-hmm. i personally like to find properties that are in decent neighborhoods but are at the kind of the lower price point of that neighborhood or of that town at the end of the day like what i'm looking for like you guys have matches right in your mls like if you list a home like how many people are matched with this do you have that in your mls Uh, reverse prospecting yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so they they call it different things in different towns but for us they call it matches which means like how many people are on the mls looking for that type of property i want to have a ton of matches so Mm -hmm. 
what that means for me, like, you know, in the greater Boston area, I would say $600,000 is probably like a, you know, run of the mill average house, but you do have. Must be nice, Tom. Moving to Boston again. Yeah. And you, you do have things on both sides, but I want to, I want to renovate a home and put it on the market ideally in the four to 500 range so that again, it's attracting the most amount of people. I don't personally like doing luxury um, for a lot of different reasons. I also like to do projects with the market kind of, nobody knows what's going on right now. Nobody. And uh, not that, not that uh, everybody ever does, but I feel like now there's more uncertainty than ever. Right. And definitely. There is. Right. And so yeah. I want to, I want to do a project that's going to be really quick. Like I want to do a project where I can renovate it for 30 days. So and one still be in the same market when you turn yeah. around Bingo. and sell it. Right. Bingo. That's, that is exactly what I said, yeah. because I, I look at it like this and I know you, you've both been in real estate for a good enough period of time. The real estate market doesn't crash in a month. It doesn't crash in two right. months. Like it, it just takes more time. Right. So I like to be able to buy and sell something in the same market. That's what I tell people. That's what I tell people who even like invest in our company when they ask like, well, what's the risk of investing with you? I go, well, there's always risk, you know, investing with anybody on anything, but I like to minimize that risk by being in and out so quickly that you know, you, we'd have to kind of make up scenarios that haven't happened before to how the real estate market could crash in like a 30 day period. Right. Oh, yeah. I love that. And what's striking me that you're actually talking about is supply and demand, understanding supply and demand by looking at the matches or the reverse prospecting. You're just trying to get a glimpse into the demand and that's you it. can see what the supply is. So that's that. That feels thing. like math, Monica. It's yeah. not. It is like the foundation of all things in our business that a lot of agents, they don't look at. They just look backwards at comps instead of looking at the dynamics of what's going on well, right now. Yeah. I mean, comps comps are fine, but what you don't know about comps, especially like a sold, is you don't know whether there was one offer or 30 offers. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, and what I like to know based on the matches, I know that the, if when the matches go up, that just means more offers because that means right. that there's a bigger buyer pool. And that's why I, I don't like to do luxury because if I'm selling at a million dollar plus price point, yes, the comp might show a million bucks, but it doesn't show that there was only one offer. And what what, it, what would it have sold for if that one buyer didn't buy it? Maybe the real number might've been 950. Whereas when I have enough matches, I know okay, I'm selling my house for 450000 If that buyer didn't buy it, I probably had another four fifty, and then I had a four forty five, and I had a four forty. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Love that. And I think too, just as like um, a plug for EXP and our agents, we have like an iBuyer program where you can guarantee multiple offers for your sellers by putting them through this offer program. So if you're at EXP and you don't know what express offers is definitely look at that because as Tom's saying, it's a, it's a great solution. It really shows them, Hey, this is what somebody would offer for your house. As a matter of fact, here's three offers for the house. Here's mm -hmm. what the market is saying. Here's what we could sell it for. If you're willing to do these things or whatever, it just opens up the conversation for what do you really want here? Mm -hmm. Seller? What do you want? Really? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Tom, um, so cool. okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. thank it's you. good. I think this is, it's definitely the future of real estate. I know there's a many agents that, out there that want to take on a more consultative approach with their sellers. They also want to be investors. What is a way that we can get more information on what questions to ask? If we want to invest, how do we start doing that? How can we get in touch with you? How do we get in your, in your world? The best way, and I make it really easy, you know, purposely, is I created a Facebook group called Agent Investor. And people can go just by typing in the URL agentinvestor.com. I, I do a live stream in the group every Tuesday at 11 a.m. It also stores in that group. When you go in that group, you'll see, I think there's close to 12,000 agents in the group now. We've been That's growing amazing. it for a little bit over a year. Wow. And, yeah. And, um, and so what you'll see is there's a bunch of training in that group and it's all completely free. We do have ways for people to work with us more directly, but most of the information we give 
Um, well, everything in that group that we give is completely free. And then the other thing that I would recommend doing is listening to a couple episodes of the Agent Investor Podcast, which people can go to at www.agentinvestorpodcast.com. I know, you know, you're listening to a podcast right now. To me, podcasts are the biggest no-brainer in terms of getting educated. And when I started in real estate, podcasting wasn't a thing. Like I used to, ha- we used to have to go to a seminar and sit there mm-hmm. for two days or, right. or CD too long CDs or like yes. you know, find, find that quiet time in our house where we can read a book. And then yeah, we, read, right. we, we read five pages and then somebody interrupts us and you can just, I mean, this is the great thing about 2023 is like, you can get educated to and from appointments. You yes. can get educated while you're walking your dog. You can get educated while you're, you know, doing your laundry. And so, you know, I mean, definitely, I hope people check out my podcast, but be a podcast listener in general. I love awesome. that. And I ho- and I will be tuning into your podcast for sure. A awesome. lot of uh, the number, what you've done, over a thousand flips, right? Yeah. And you have, you own your, your company, your group owns over 300 doors. Is that right? Yeah, three over 300 doors. We've got a real estate brokerage with 350 agents, all based on the premise like every agent should be an investor. And, you know, we have a saying sales will make you a living, investing will make you wealthy. Yeah. Very cool. All right, Tom, thanks for your time. That's going to have to be the end of today's podcast. If you liked what you saw or you've had a conversation with a friend, agent, and you think they might like this, send this to them for sure. Yes. And if you're an agent and you want to know how to partner with Monica and I so we can help you grow your business, feel free to give me a call or a text at 513-400-1691. Hey, Tom, thanks a lot. We really appreciate you being on. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for having me on. See you next